Hello scholars, I'm Dr. Brenda G. Harris and I am very happy to spend this time with you today to share a short story called Butterflies. And it is written by Patricia Grace. Um, I often will refer to it as the Butterflies girl story. Um, I like this story a lot because it's not only short, but it also captures so well so many of the issues that we talk about when we're concerned with educational equity and educational inequity. As school teachers, we are the ones that really make the difference. When the rubber hits the road, it's the teachers that really direct it toward educational equity or educational inequity. And so historically, unfortunately, the trends have gone toward uh, educational inequity. If you have been considered in any way a minoritized group based on gender, primary language, race and ethnicity, uh, se sexuality, so anything that's seen as diverse, diverse from what, right? Um, those have been the individuals and the populations that have tended to face educational inequities. So as a teacher, as an educator, we tend to come into our profession because we love learning, we love learners, and we want to bring the two together. Successful learning, exemplary learning, that's what we want for all learners, to have an opportunity for quality educational experiences, outcomes, and opportunities. So how do we make that happen and why hasn't it been happening? Well, this little story about the butterflies girl captures all these. So we're gonna uh, go through this story and see if we can unpack why and how educational equity is not the norm, but educational inequity is what tends to be realized in US public schooling. As an educator, I didn't come into education because I wanted to realize educational inequity. I wanted to be someone who was a dream keeper as someone who could promote educational equity for all learners. So there's a story, um, there's a character in Toni Morrison's uh, famous novel, Beloved and the character in the story is school teacher and seth one of the main characters in beloved uh, she says nobody more dangerous than school teacher school teachers are dangerous they can either promote equity or they can hinder it if a child a community a family a school is identified as minoritized in any way, oftentimes they are very dependent on the quality of the teachers who work there. And so some students will do well in spite of their teacher. Uh, some students will do well in spite of their school because perhaps they have family resources, background community resources and opportunities that can compensate for maybe poor quality teaching teachers and opportunities in their school. Other learners don't have that. They, if they don't have a good teacher, someone who is able to realize educational equity, then oftentimes they don't have that opportunity to succeed in spite of their teacher. You know, there's always hope, always hope. And yet the patterns are clear that in um, these schools that serve minoritized communities, uh, they tend to get the least experienced teachers. They also tend to get the less qualified teachers. 
they also tend to get the teachers that are less effective. And so if we're really committed to educational opportunity for all learners, then that means that we all have to be exemplary teachers. We have to be dream keeper teachers. So let's take a look at what's happening in this story with the butterflies girl. And what kind of a teacher do you think she has? And what could this teacher do? Okay. So let's just look at our short story. You have a copy of it in the module, um, but we'll go through it here. Okay. Butterflies. The grandmother plaited her granddaughter's hair, and then she said, Get your lunch. Put it in your bag. Get your apple. You come straight back after school. Listen to the teacher, she said. Do what she say. Her grandfather was out on the step. He walked down the path with her and out onto the footpath. He said to a neighbor, Our granddaughter goes to school. She lives with us now. The neighbor said, She's fine. She's terrific with her two plaits in her hair. And clever, the grandfather said. Writes every day in her book. She's fine, the neighbor said. The grandfather waited with his granddaughter by the crossing, and then he said, go to school. Listen to the teacher. Do what she say. When the granddaughter came home from school, the grandfather was hoeing the cabbages. Her grandmother was picking beans. They stopped their work. You bring your book home? The grandmother asked. Yes. You write your story? Yes. What's your story? About the butterflies? Get your book then. Read your story. The granddaughter took her book from her school bag and opened it. I, I killed all the butterflies. She read. This is me and this is all the butterflies. And your teacher? She liked your story, did she? I don't know. What your teacher say? She said butterflies are beautiful creatures. They hatch out and fly in the sun. The butterflies visit all the pretty flowers, she said. They lay their eggs and then they die. You don't kill butterflies. That's what she said. The grandmother and grandfather were quiet for a long time. And their granddaughter holding the book stood quite still in the warm garden. Because you see, the grandfather said, your teacher? She buy all her cabbages in the supermarket and that's why. Patricia Grace, the author, is from New Zealand. Okay. Let's take a moment now and think about it. What do we know about the story? We're interested in exemplary learning for all learners. And to do so, we have got to pay attention to context. We're interested in schools, society and social differences and how those three work together or don't work together to promote educational equity and exemplary teaching and learning for every student because every student can learn right okay so what do we know let's go back to the beginning of the story what do you hear and see well, the grandmother is fixing her granddaughter's hair um the grandmother plaited her granddaughter's, or plaited, I'm sorry. The granddaughter plaited her granddaughter's hair. Okay, so right off the bat, we know, okay, I know I haven't had my hair plaited. Um, that tends to be something where you put like cornrows in your hair, okay? So if you have plaits in your hair, um, 
So right off the diff, right off the bat, we know something about um, hairstyles, hair texture, and we know that it tends to vary from the dominant mainstream. That's what we can guess from the word plaited. So the grandmother's taking care of her um, and getting her ready for school. So we have not only a different way of doing hair, but we also have a different family formation than what we think about as society's norm, right? We have a um, granddaughter being raised and cared for by grandparents instead of parents. Okay, so we don't have any idea where the parents are, but we know that they're not there because they are taking care of their granddaughter and getting her ready for school. Okay, so we've got two things already that are kind of marking a racial and ethnic diversity as well as um, family diversity. Okay, get your lunch, put it in your bag, get your apple, come back after school straight home here listen to the teacher do what she say okay now just the cadence of the language the way that the sentences are constructed we get a hint here that there might be some language differences as difference from primary english speakers right perhaps this is a different dialect of english Maybe it's not so-called standard English, but a, a variation. Um, it doesn't sound like it's uh, black English from the United States, um, but maybe it's from somewhere um, in the Caribbean. Could be. Um, could be that these are speakers of languages other than English, and English is their second language. So right off the bat there, we now we have three contextual things to think about. Um, language differences, uh, hair could possibly talk about racial and ethnic differences, and also family formation. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. Um, can you come up with something else before I do? Are you naming the same things that I'm naming? Okay, um, now think about how the grandfather and the grandmother are showing their care, right? They clearly love their granddaughter and want the best for her. Um, the grandmother was the one who was making sure that she had her book, giving her instructions, did her hair, make sure she looked presentable for, before she walks out the door. Um, the grandfather also gives her instructions about um, coming home and and clearly they do care about education, right? Sometimes you hear that minoritized groups don't care about education, but in this case, the grandparents here, they do care about education. They bring it home to their granddaughter in their instructions. They constantly repeat, do what your teachers say. So they do care about education. They want her to be respectful to their teacher, to her teacher. Um, they do care about education, that's clear. And they also care about their granddaughter. Um, they say, the grandfather says that she's, she's so clever. You know, she's smart um, and she's a good person. They say that she's fine. And the neighbor, the neighbor reinforces that. So you got kind of a community um, since the neighbors representing the community where the, the community cares, where the child is the community's child as well as that family's child. And they care about, um, about group uplift, about education. In many communities, especially in black communities, you'll have um, other mothering where if the biological parent isn't there you have other mothers and other fathers where people will step in and um, it might be in the grocery store and a kid's not acting what they consider um, with good home training and they might say uh, they might step in and correct that child and so you've got the community raising um, the child in the sense that it takes a village they're all reinforcing and supporting and valuing this child here she's fine 
Um, she's smart, so she's getting a lot of positive reinforcement at home and in the community. So you got connections to the community as well. It's not just individual, but the community is there too. Okay, so off she goes, and while the little girl's at school, then um, what do the uh, grandparents do? Um, we know that the grandfather um, was hoeing the around the cabbages when she gets the little girl gets back from um, school and the grandmother was also out in the garden she was picking beans um, and so we get some idea of um, perhaps what their economic um, a role is they seem to be farmers or perhaps if they're not farmers they do get much of their produce it sounds like from their um, garden um, so the cabbages are, are very important here um, and it seems to be agricultural and so here again you've got some sort of um, diversity right uh, whereas the school uh, that is tends to be schools tend to be in cities and um, urban communities maybe a village you know some sort of a, a place where people are together and it sounds like the little girl is coming from more of a rural area where you've got gardens and farming and so it sounds pretty agricultural um, so there's some differences as well. So we've got quite a few already going on that um, are playing a role in school, society, and differences, okay? And we'll see how these come together to influence this little girl's experience and her outcomes in school. Okay, so she gets off the bus and she comes home and right away the grandmother's asking her, you know, how did your day go? What did you learn? And again, we often hear these um, stereotypes that um, minoritized families don't care about education. They're not interested in what their uh, children and grandchildren, what the youth do. But that's clearly not the case here. Um, first thing that grandmother says is you bring your book home. It sounds like she's wanting to know about uh, homework. Okay, and the little girl did. She's obedient. Um, she did bring it. And then she answers some questions that the grandparents um, want to know about school. So they're very invested in her education. Um, you write your story. Um, again, kind of, we get a hint of perhaps a different dialect of English. It doesn't sound like it's standard English. Uh, so language differences. And the child, uh, she says, yes. Um, what's your story about butterflies? So the little girl tells what she wrote about. Get your book then. Read your story. The granddaughter brings her book and, and then she reads her story. I killed all the butterflies, she said. This is me, and this is the butterflies. Okay, so there's the story. I killed the butterflies. Uh, then the grandmother is aware that there could be a problem here. She says, and you, teacher, like the story, did she? the little girl doesn't say something for a while and then she says I don't know what your teacher say so the grandmother kind of knows there's something going on there the little girl she probably does know right um, even if you don't speak the same language most communication comes through body language and so the little girl probably does know that right we often do know um, what message is being communicated to us even if somebody's words are saying one thing their body might be saying another thing and we know how to read that because we're competent in our culture 
um, and we're competent in what human beings are conveying to each other. So this little girl, she says, I don't know, but the grandmother seems to think that she does know, and so she probes a little different. Again, she cares about her granddaughter, clearly, and she cares about education, so she's digging into this. Um, what your teacher say? Okay, so the little girl then tells her. She said, butterflies are beautiful creatures. They hatch out and fly in the sun. The butterflies visit all the pretty flowers, she said. They lay their eggs and then they die. You don't kill butterflies. That's what she said. Hmm. Okay, so now you got two stories, right? The little girl's story, I kill butterflies. And then the teacher's story, no, you don't. No, you don't kill butterflies. Um, they're, they're beautiful creatures. Okay, so you got two different stories going on here. Now remember that. Okay, and then the grandparents, they know that there's two different stories because what happens? They are quiet for a long time. And they don't say anything. But then... They break their silence and they explain the two stories to their granddaughter, they say. Because, you see, your teacher, she buy all her cabbages at the supermarket. That's why. Do you get it? Does that make sense? The little girl understands now. She understands her, her story and the teacher's story and her grandparents just explained it why their two stories are different the grandfather connected them by saying your teacher she buy her cabbages in the grocery store that's why there's two stories does that make sense so for a lot of scholars in my classes and workshops that it doesn't make sense to them they're like I don't know. I got nothing. And that's okay. Because that's what we're learning is how to read these contextual factors to be able to promote educational equity and success. Okay. So if you don't know how the grandfather connected them, that is okay. I'm going to tell you and then you will know. Okay. So if you think that you know... And you said, well, the reason that the grandfather connected the two stories, the granddaughter's I kill butterflies and the teacher's butterflies are beautiful, you don't kill them. The grandfather connected them by saying your teacher, she buy her cabbages in the grocery store. So the teacher does not know that butterflies will harm and kill the growth of the cabbages. And therefore, because she doesn't have farming knowledge to know that about butterflies, she thinks that it is bad to kill them. She thinks they're beautiful. The people who are have agricultural knowledge, though, and raise cabbages, and that's their source of income and a living, they know very well you better kill the butterflies because the butterflies are going to harm your crop and then you won't have as many cabbages and you will not have the income that you need to be able to sell the cabbages and make money to support your family or you won't have the cabbages that you need to feed your family and to provide um uh, fruits and vegetables for your family through the winter okay so this is about survival on the little girl in the community side butterflies you kill them and if you know that knowledge base that community knowledge you know that you need to kill those butterflies if you buy your cabbages in the in the supermarket you might not know how butterflies affect that. And so you don't need to know that because they have cabbages in the grocery store all year long. You might pay more for them in the winter or whatever, but you do, you can go get them. Your income isn't necessarily dependent on how many cabbages you buy at the store. 
So you don't need to know that that's not in your community cultural wealth or knowledge. So the two stories are connected because of the role of the butterfly. With one community, they understand that that's going to harm them if the butterflies are hurting their crops. The teacher doesn't need to know about farming because she gets her groceries at the butter at the grocery store and she doesn't know that butterflies kill them. Okay, so you might be saying, well, who cares? You know, the grandfather and now the little girl and the community understand why the teacher doesn't realize that. But their differences make a difference. And so remember when we talked about that school teacher can be a very dangerous, school teacher is dangerous because school teacher can make or break if the community is dependent on the school instead of a community that will may uh, succeed despite the teacher in the school. Okay, so the reason that is so is go back to the scenario when the little girl is showing the teacher her story. I killed all the butterflies. This is me and this is the butterflies. Now imagine that you are that teacher. Now that teacher doesn't know that butterflies harm crops. So that teacher's looking at it and she's like, oh my goodness, this little girl has violent tendencies, right? Ah, I need, maybe I, a red flag here. I need to alert the, um, I, maybe some abuse might be going on. Uh, maybe there's some disposition issue here with this child. Maybe she's being abused at home. You know, some, what's going on here? Uh, maybe I need to refer this child to special education. Uh, something's going on because uh, in my world, we don't kill uh, butterflies. They're beautiful and they help to pollinate. Okay. So... From the little girl's perspective, though, she's like, oh no, when I get home, uh, I know that we go out into the field and we hold the cabbages and we better kill the butterflies. So why is the teacher telling me this? And so from the, te from the child's perspective, the child's sitting here going, well, wait a minute, um, is my teacher lying to me? You know, I know that we do kill butterflies, and she just told me that we don't. I go home, I go to my family, and I see what's happening out in my community. We kill them. And she just said, well, we don't. Okay, so maybe she is a liar. Maybe she lies. Maybe I can't trust what she says. You know, that's going to be a problem for me as a student because I'm dependent on what the teacher says. And if I don't follow instructions, we have rooms and places for kids that don't follow in instruction, right? We send them um, to the principal's office. We send them to retract. We send them everywhere else but in the classroom where they're going to get instruction. Okay, so that's a problem. Um, so maybe from the per little girl's perspective, she's like, well, okay, my teacher doesn't tell the truth. My teacher lies. Okay. But maybe the little girl is thinking, oh my gosh, my teacher, my teacher, she's important. And my grand, my grandparents always tell me, listen to the teacher, she clearly is the one in authority here. I have to respect her. And she said that we must kill the butterflies. So she has to be right because she's the teacher. And that's the person of authority. So therefore, at home, when I go at home, who's wrong here then? It must be everybody in my home, in my community you people must be doing it wrong because my teacher said butterflies are beautiful and you don't kill butterflies. And I see you all at home killing them. So therefore, uh, maybe if the teacher's right, that means you're wrong. And I thought that, so I got to get rid of that. I need to subtract that from myself. I'm going to go with the teacher story because the teacher story is the right story she said you don't kill them you 
value them, right? You don't kill them. They're beautiful creatures. Okay, so then I can't trust anymore what's in my home. I don't I don't want to be like that. I gotta I'm gonna start being subtractive. I'm going to start feeling bad about myself. Okay, and that's never good for positive learning, right? If I'm I think that I'm not good enough and I have to subtract myself. I don't like me. I don't like my community because that doesn't match what my teacher said. And so I'm going to try to do my teacher story and I'm going to try to write my teacher story and do my teacher's way. But that's not really me. So I'm going to always be falling short because I, that's not what I know. That's not what I am. So that's a problem, right? It's a problem if I, as the student, think that the teacher lies. That's a problem, right? Um, it's a problem if I ex just accept what the teacher says and I'm going to try to do her story and subtract my own story and get, and subtract my, my community story. Okay, so the other thing that I could do as a student is I could say, look, you're telling me, teacher, you're telling me that we don't kill butterflies, that butterflies are beautiful. But I know in my house and in my community, butterflies are bad. We do kill them. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I don't care if you're the teacher. Right. And so I'm going to be rebellious. I'm going to be resistant. I'm going to be like, I don't care what you say. I'm going to stick to my story. This is my story. I don't care about your story. That's going to be a problem too, right? Because when you think about teaching and learning, then this relationship needs to be positive between teacher and student. It needs to be trusting and supportive and caring and if I'm the student and I believe that you don't like my story and you want me to get rid of my story and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is my story and I'm hanging on to it. We're going to be at loggerheads, okay? And so I'm going to act up in class and they have places for kids like me, right? Are they going to send me uh, expel me, send me to special ed with a behavior uh, disorder or something like that. They're going to send me um, uh, to retract. Where they're going to get rid of a rebellious child like me, right? And so I'm going to be one of those children that learns pretty early. School is not a good place. It's not a, not somewhere where I can feel safe and trusted. And I can feel like who I am matters in the classroom. Okay. So in none of these scenarios is this a good way to promote te positive and exemplary teaching and learning, right? If I'm the student and I say, this is my story and I'm sticking to it, I don't care how much you tell me about butterflies are beautiful. I know they're not. I'm going to stick with my story. That's not going to promote a learning. If I'm the student and I say, great, your story's the right story, teacher. I'm going to get rid of my story. I'm going to subtract that out of me. And I'm going to try to be your story. That's a problem too, right? And so whether we are being subtractive or resistant or rebellious or I think the teacher's lying, any of these kind of scenarios, um, they keep us as student and teacher apart. And not because teacher's a bad person or the student is a bad person but because they're coming from different cultural knowledge bases, right? And different experiences, and they're missing each other. They're not connecting like they're supposed to. And therefore, you're going to have a problem with teaching and learning and, and realizing that. And oftentimes, that is what happens. So teacher here, whether she intends to or not, if she sticks to her story about butterflies are beautiful, you don't kill them, she is not going to be effective 
in reaching and teaching this child or this group of children. And so this is going to be a very uncomfortable, unsuccessful, and ultimately children leave school or fail school because they aren't getting that connection in classrooms. So a teacher is a dangerous person, whether she realizes it or not, or he realizes it or not, or they realize it or not, um, whether they intend it or not, uh, teacher are very dangerous. They make the difference in which way that goes. Teacher has got to learn how to connect with the students, especially from diverse backgrounds. That often naturally happens when the teacher's background and the student's background happens, not always, but they it's more natural because they come from the same background. So if there's a lot of diversity in here, there's more likely to be collisions and teacher has to learn how to make those connections so that both sides, teacher and student, can walk in both worlds and meet each other and be successful. This little girl can be herself and successful in school and this teacher can make it happen, okay? That teacher can be a dream keeper teacher. Alrighty, I will see you later. Thanks for listening.